Our passage for this morning comes from Luke chapter 4, verses, I'm going to read 14 through 30. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure, your, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we heard you did at Capernaum. He said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet, Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow, Zarephath, Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill, on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Merciful God, I pray that the meditations of all of our hearts, souls, and minds may be pleasing unto your sight, for you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When you've been gone from home for a while, you know, for example, if you've left home when you were 18 years old, never to turn back, it can be a very difficult place to go back to. See, time and memory are funny things. And we have a way of um, locking people in our memories just as they left. The thing is, 18-year-olds change, people change, life moves on, people mature. And there are times when God gets a hold of people and they are never the same again. So going home can be difficult. But Jesus of Nazareth is going, of Nazareth, is going back to Nazareth and he's going back to home and his whole hometown is a buzz about this, about his homecoming. He's filled with the spirit He has an invitation to preach from his home church, his home synagogue. He has his friends by his side, and so he goes back home. And he goes to the synagogue on the day of Sabbath, the day of worship, as was his custom. See, Jesus, and that's that you'll hear that a lot in Scripture, as was his custom. He is faithful. He was raised by good and faithful parents. And Jesus is faithful to the traditions that he was taught. With there's a lot of anticipation for his coming home. Because people know that Jesus, their hometown boy, has a reputation across the region. Rumors have been going around all over the region, all over Galilee, about the things that he's been doing. All the healing People with def- deformities and paralysis, madmen, have all been changed by the touch of Jesus. Can you believe, they wonder, 
that this is Jesus, that this kind of wisdom and teaching can come from Joseph's side. He's just a carpenter's son. And not only are his teachings becoming more and more popular, he now has people who follow him. He has disciples. That's a sign of being a grand teacher or rabbi. But only real rabbis who have been instructed in the best schools in Jerusalem have disciples. They wonder where all of this has come from. Maybe it was Mary, his mother. Maybe all those smarts, those know-how, that faithfulness, maybe it came from Mary. Can you just hear their gossip in the tent maker's shed at the beauty parlor? All of them wait. Well, on this particular day, the synagogue was really full because nobody is going to miss out on a hometown boy who's become a regional sensation. The rabbi who is at the synagogue is just as curious as the rest as he hands Jesus the scroll to read, the, the, the scripture of the day. And he's in the seat of honor. And they're all waiting to see what's going to happen. He hands him the scripture of the day. Jesus stands up to read. And he reads from the prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He sits down. He stands up to read. He sits down to preach. That was the custom. All eyes are on Jesus as they wait. He, he leans forward in his seat as they wait for him to unpack this scripture, which is what rabbis would have done. He takes a deep breath. And he preaches the shortest sermon on record. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. You could hear a pin drop. A wait for him to say more, to do more, until it dawns on them what he has just said. And he has said plenty for their ears. Today, right now, right this very moment, this scripture has been fulfilled in me. I am this scripture. A few seconds tick by. The air is filled with the, the, the tension, people waiting with bated breath. A wave of murmurs start across the congregation. Low wows. And oh, he sounds like a rabbi. And his voice has gotten so deep, he's got a preacher's voice. Others are amazed at his brevity. People like short sermons. <laughs> but they all are anticipating the healing, the miraculous things that he's done. They wait. They want to see it for themselves. They want the release from the clutches of Rome. They want him to call forth that jubilee year. Are you familiar with jubilee year? All debts will be forgiven. Can you imagine your credit card bills just being cut up? Come on. Prisoners are released and, and slaves are released from their um, work. Families go back to ancestral lands. Sounds like a great year of rest and no people are more deserving than the Nazareans his own hometown if he's going to do it it's got to start there people start looking around at one another I mean they're, they're waiting for something to come waiting for the show to start 
After all, that's what he's been doing in the region of, of Capernaum and Galilee. Why not here? He can hear their whispers. He senses and smells the stench of their entitlement, and he wants no part of it. See, Jesus has spent 40 days in the desert being tempted by Satan, being tempted to make a show of his power and authority to prove who he is. And he didn't give in to Satan, and he certainly is not going to give in to his hometown. And he looks at them with a fire in the belly, and he says to them, I am sure you're going to quote to me this age-old proverb, doctor, cure thyself, doctor, cure yourself. Have you ever wondered what that means? It does not mean what we, we would say it means. It means we deserve it. It means it's not only right that you heal your family and your friends first before you heal a bunch of strangers and Gentile dogs. See, that's the Jewish way. You take care of family first. But Jesus says to them, no prophet ever has honor in their hometown. No one's been, no prophet's been accepted in their own hometown. They're not accepted at home, and they're not accepted in their own family. And then he launches into times in their history when the superheroes of their faith, Elijah and Elisha, were sent by God to the outsiders, the undeserved, rather than God's chosen people. There was a time of great famine and drought where people lost everything, where widows, where people were widowed. But Elijah did not go to those widows. There were many lepers and those with skin diseases who were living during the time of Elisha. But instead, Elisha went to Naaman, a Syrian, an outsider. Jesus stood before his people, the very people who wiped his nose when he was a toddler. These are the people that changed his diaper. These are the folks who taught him to read the scriptures, to memorize Torah. These are the folks who were with him when his father died. They all watched him grow up. They fed him. They taught him. And they knew every little human thing about Jesus. And as he stands before them and announces to them that he is the one that they have been waiting for, they just cannot see it. They won't accept it. All they see is little old Jesus, the son of a carpenter. This is one of my favorite chapters, chapter four in the Gospel of Luke to study, and I've, I've done a lot of work in chapter four. I think to really understand the Gospel of Luke, you got to spend some time in four. Um, I can resonate with the difficulty of going back home, but in all my studies, in all my time, I have never thought um, more about his hometown and the difficulty it must have been to accept him. That's where the Spirit led me this time in this scripture. That's where I have been wrestling. That interchange where Jesus snaps with them. What is that? How difficult it must have been to see beyond the memories of Jesus as a boy to move beyond the intertwining and the dynamics of, the, of, of a, a small town called Nazareth. How can a man so normal and so human, with dirty, dusty feet and thrift store clothes, be who Jesus says he is? Is that really who God is? They can't see beyond their parochial, provincial ways to see what's happening before their eyes. To set aside their selfish desires for Jesus to, to prove his, 
his case before them, to let go of their entitlement, to lay down their expectations that Jesus would show off his godship before them. I think it's difficult to see, to really see God and the people closest to us. For the last 14 years, I've been with my husband. When he wakes up and when he goes to bed, we eat together. I wash his clothes. I throw out his dirty, you know, pit-stained white t-shirts when they get nasty enough. I replace his toothbrush without even, even asking. Okay? And I'm with him when he's sick. I've seen all the ups and downs and he with me. We would call that love, but it's, I just, I call it marriage. (laughs) Some days I just have to tell you, it is tough to see the indwelling spirit in this man who I adore and love because we're busy running after kids and paying bills and fighting over who's going to get more time to write. That's what we fight over. So much of our existence is just normal, normal and mundane, not spirit-filled, not God-inspired, not the, where we can ponder the ethereal nature of God and unsullied. Or is it? I mean, perhaps our challenge is, is not to try to brush off or ignore the very human things about those closest to us, to wait for those moments when it's all cleaned up. God chooses to dwell in and among us, and God doesn't wait for us to have it all together. I mean, God shows up right where we are. And God shows up right where our loved ones are too, now. So here's what's so sad about Jesus' interaction with his hometown. They were really hungry for a Messiah. They were occupied by yet another superpower, and this time that superpower's name was Rome. The people prayed deeply for God's freedom and deliverance. They really, really wanted and desired their Messiah. But they couldn't get beyond their sense of entitlement to join with Jesus as he announced to his hometown who he really was for the first time and the last time. They became furious with him, with his claims. They grabbed him out of that seat of authority, dragged him out of the synagogue and across town to the place where their town was built on, a hill, to throw him off the edge of a cliff. What an interesting passage. Have you ever looked at that? A hill and then a cliff, which one is it? To be thrown off the edge of a cliff is penalty for blasphemy. So instead of joining with Jesus and, and, and celebrating the things that he had been raised in their own hometown by them, they called him a blasphemer and they tried to kill him. They accused him of profaning God's name and word. What a homecoming. He never went back there again. Jesus told his hometown that now, now is the day that God is at work. Today, now, right before your eyes, look and see. Jesus is asking his hometown to have God-sized eyes. To see the God that's right before them. Stop looking for the flash in the pan. Stop waiting for God to do something miraculous because God is with you now, right before your eyes. God may be so very present in your children and in your spouse, in your parents, 
Even in your coworkers, we tend, for those of us who, who work full time, we tend to spend more time with our coworkers than we do our own family. Look deeply into those around you. Look past their morning breath and their dirty fingernails and the phone bill that they forgot to pay. Look deeply into their heart. Search your soul with God for the ones nearest to you because that may be the very place where we experience the deepest depths of God's love and mercy. Donna Butler Brass says, if we see, if we, if we can see and experience and grasp that active force of love that's work and alive in our world now, our fear recedes, our hatreds melt, our willingness to murder and kill and seek revenge flows away with the tide. And we can recognize that in the midst of all things, even in the worst oppression, God is with us. When we have the courage to lay down our delusions of of control, I'm deluded with control most of the time, our delusions of, of domination, the clarity of grace and mercy and justice make themselves known to us. And that transforms fear into compassion, giving us the power to walk in the way that God has intended for us. Imagine with me what it would have been like if Nazareth had accepted him. What did they miss out on? A lot. Our experience with God shifts and changes when we can recognize that God is in and among us and the cracks and the crevices of our very existence and the loved ones that are sitting next to you. There, right now, God is alive. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us stand and sing our final hymn.